Hey guys, welcome to episode 12 of Dr. Will's Straight to Tape with myself, Dr. Will O'Connor, sports scientist, educator, and endurance athlete. Man, this morning has been one of those days. I want to come in, shoot a quick video, and then nothing works. And I spend like an hour doing it. If anyone has a, a smart trainer and wants to Zwift, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where you just want to get on your bike, do a session. It's supposed to be easier than going out on the road and you spend an hour and a half pulling your hair out and throwing your toys out the cot because the damn thing just won't connect or work or give you resistance. And all you want to do is a simple session in a time-effective manner technology right well that's not the topic of today's discussion today's straight to tape is around threshold so along so part of my job is I work with athletes and coaches so I'm an educator coach of coaches and it was we had the topic of threshold and the coach was going like what is threshold how am I supposed to utilize it and explain it to the athletes that I work with so look let's Let's just break it down, get it real simple. Let's use threshold and let's use some zones and let's try and figure this out. Look, threshold is the line in the sand and we go, okay, above that is finite. You can only exercise for a certain amount of time above your threshold. Your threshold being the point at which anaerobic metabolism starts to play a greater contributing factor, or I guess plays a greater role in ATP production. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of biochemistry here. I'm just going to give you a little rundown of how the cells work and the muscle cells work. So we have aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. So they will never work in isolation. They'll both be, at, at some point in time, you're going to have a con contribution of both of those systems. So we know, you know, we've probably heard of aerobic training, aerobic base. Put simply, we are able to utilize oxygen and we're able to utilize mainly fat, maybe a little bit of carbohydrate. And within the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, you might've heard that, the mitochondria, we're able to generate, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, like 32, 36 ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. So if we want to generate a muscular contraction, which of course we do, that's how we move, we need ATP in order to, gen to engage that muscular contraction. We need ATP. We spend ATP as, as the energy in order for us to you know, generate a muscular contraction. So if we can use oxygen, we are making ATP aerobically and it's really efficient and it's essentially limitless because you know, even in altitude, oxygen's not really the limiting factor. Okay, then as that, Part of that is that it's, I want to say, kind of slow, all right? So now you want to exercise quite fast. You want to do not only large muscular contractions, but really quick muscular contractions. So then we need ATP really quickly. So to get that ATP really quickly, oxygen and fat or the utilizing the mitochondria, transporting fats, uh, using the whole TCA Krebs cycle, like it's quite slow. It's a, it's a grinding process. It's like a diesel engine. So we need some quick high octane fuel and that's where we utilize our glycogen or glucose glycolysis and we generate lactate and hydrogen ions that is limited so our uh our glycogen pool you might have heard of carb loading you know that's in order for us to store glycogen and glycogen is our stored carbohydrate our stored glucose and you know i i think you probably know that we need to have gels or sports drink or we need to fuel ourselves when we're trying to do something for hours on end or even around an hour plus you're going to want to have like a little bit of carbs a little bit of sugar in order to allow your anaerobic metabolism to continue to function and also just some form of of your aerobic metabolism is going to utilize a little bit of glucose as well so we just need to may be able to support that but it's finite, okay? It's limited. Once you run out of glycogen as factor one, you've got no more sugar, okay? Regardless of if you're taking sugar in, the fact that your muscle cells have fully depleted themselves of glycogen is going to force you to slow down because 
there's metabolic signaling involved in that and your brain is worried that it's at risk of of running out of sugar itself so it's, you know let's just let's let's cool cool the jets and slow down so that's that's the process of hitting the wall bonking blowing up in a longer endurance event then there's factor two, and that is if you were doing, you know, your two minute or five minute all out effort, and you start to accumulate acidity due to the uh, anaerobic metabolism, the function of producing lactate, having to buffer lactate and hydrogen ions, not just the lactate is not really the huge issue. It's, it's the hydrogen ions, the acidity and the breakdown of function within the cell. So then you have that and that's what's that that's the burning sensation you know and that's the that's what's slowing you down when you're doing those those shorter you know less than 10 minute kind of efforts and that end spurt uh, of your 5k 10k so we've got you know we've got the lactate production we've got the acidity build up of the anaerobic uh, metabolism and then we have the the limited resources so if that's kind of your end product and then we have the starting reactant which is your glucose or glycogen so we have these two limiting factors that are going to uh, reduce your ability to exercise at you know above your threshold for an indefinite amount of time whereas we go below that threshold and we are still utilizing quite a bit of carbohydrate and we are still if we just you know if we're you know whatever 99 percent 97 percent of your threshold if we're just below that line we are utilizing these, this carbohydrate and we're generating some of this lactate and the hydrogen ions, but we're doing it in a way that if we're fueling appropriately, you know, with our sports drink and our gels and goos, lollies, whatever, we're able to input enough of the reactant, enough of the fuel, and then we are able metabolically, especially if we're well-trained enough, to buffer the acidity with, and the lactate so we've got our bicarbonate pool and we've got blowing off CO2. So we have the ability to exercise for quite a long time below threshold. Now, there is a factor three that can really influence everything, even your ability uh, to exercise well below threshold, and that is the heat. So as soon as we accumulate too much heat in our core, temperature gets too high, we're done. Okay, There's, there's just no way around that, regardless of how easy you're doing it. If you're in a 50 degree Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit, like you, you're just not going to be able to exercise that fast. Ooh, story for another day, right? So we've got that line. Okay. So we hopefully, you know, that background of metabolism, uh, biochemistry of how the, those two functions work. It shows that one is essentially indefinite. The aerobic system, oxygen, predominantly fat, limitless. All right. So we can just continue to, exercise for hours on end then as we get above our threshold we have to use glycogen and the stored pool of glycogen and a little bit of exogenous carbohydrates so your gels and sports drink and that's limited and then we have the byproduct of that which is the, the lactate and the hydrogen ions which causes a cellular functional breakdown so an inability to continue to generate muscular contractions so one indefinite one finite so then when we're exercising we want to work on some of those different systems right so we know okay we've got threshold and we know through the years and decades of science that working at particular percentages of that threshold that limit is going to induce certain stimuli and adaptations when we're looking at running a marathon, we're going to be around 90% on average of your threshold. If you're running, say, three hours or less, maybe two and a half to three and a half hours, you might be able to get 90 to 95%. If you're going more like four hours, four hours plus, you might be more like 85 to 90% of your threshold. And that's essentially the same for heart rate, power, pace. Heart rate, you might be able to operate a little bit more at an elevated um, level of that threshold just because dehydration plays a role and it's more about heart rate, stroke volume, and the subsequent cardiac output. Again, story for a different day. But we know, we know that. We know that time and time again, 
that if we operate around this 90% region for uh, your sort of exercise lasting around a few hours, we're going to be okay. And we're going to elicit a small amount of lactate. We're still going to have an anaerobic uh, contribution to our energy and are still going to have a, a utilization of our carbohydrate stores. So, you know, you, you're still going to be able to uh, bonk or hit the wall in a marathon if you're not taking in some sports drink. But then as we work further closer towards that threshold number, we're starting to quickly diminish the time at which we can, we can run or ride or whatever we're doing because we're starting to get closer to that, to that limit. And that limit is, so when we talk about threshold, we're saying, you know, it's going to be 45 minutes to an hour. You know, if, if you're just straight off the couch, it's going to be closer to 30 minutes. But we can train, we can train that. So we can train our ability to operate at that threshold. And we can train our ability to, you know, operate above the threshold or, or just below it, as we would for, say, like a half marathon or a 10 kilometer. So we, we get that threshold number. How do we get it? We can do things like a 10K run. Uh, we can do the 20 minute uh, threshold test on the bike, 20 minute power test. We can do a 5K run and we take 95% of our average pace uh, or average power. Heart rate for a, you want a, a good 20 minute sample for heart rate. So for a lot of people, that's probably not a 5k is not going to be enough. Even if you're doing 25 minutes for a 5k, you might not get a really clean 20 minute sample because the uh, slow component of heart rate means that it's going to take a while to reach a steady state. So what we'd look for is the final 20 minutes of heart rate within an effort of say half an hour to an hour and a half. So you take your tweet, your peak 20 minutes, something that you've paced well, like it's it's no good if you've gone out, you've hit 190 for 20 minutes and you've run the rest of the race at 130. 190 is not going to be your threshold. So generally, yeah, you'll take, if you've done some a half marathon or a 10K, you can take the, the 20 minute peak, peak heart rate and that's going to be your threshold. Doesn't matter if it's slightly wrong. No. Okay, because we, we're going to use this to, uh, to figure out our zones. All right, so we've got, um, I have for running power, I have my Dr. Will O'Connor's one and five method. So you take a 1K and you take your 5K and then you use my calculator online and then it gives you your, your zones and your, your threshold. And there's different words for threshold, you know, FTP, uh, functional threshold power, um, or functional threshold pace, uh, just general threshold, lactate threshold, critical power, maximal lactate steady state. They're all, they all mean pretty much the same thing. They all mean that line at which beyond it, you are diminishing returns. Below it, you can do that for what we'd call steady state for a prolonged period of time. So now, you know, we've, we've figured that out. So we've got uh, a 20 minute heart rate peak for um, something that's taken at least 30 minutes. We can do that. So uh, some, some devices, Garmin, Training peaks, they might do that for you. They might do that automatically, but it would pay to check and it would also pay to wear a heart rate strap rather than trying to rely on wrist-based heart rate. So you've got that 20 minute peak and then you've got a 5K pace. Ideally you have a 10K pace or uh, something that's gonna be 30 minutes to an hour. You're gonna have the average pace of that. That's gonna be for running pace. That'll be your pace. If you're using a 5K, take 95% of your average pace. And you want an effort where you've uh, done that reasonably, you know, you've paced it reasonably well. You haven't gone out at, you know, five minute Ks and finished in six minute Ks. So you've got an even one there, take 95% of that. And that'll be your threshold pace. And then if you're using uh, power, use my one in five calculator, or similarly do a, any kind of 10K, 5K and take either the 10K effort number or take the 95% of the 5K number. And that's going to be the best place to start for your threshold. And later on, you can analyze it and work on it. Once you've got that threshold number, you can now set your zones. So I'd just recommend doing 
an automated calculator for setting your zones. And I use Joe Friel's or Jim Vance's zones. So that's Andy Coggan on the bike, Joe Friel on the run, heart rate and pace, and then Jim Vance's uh, running power zones. Does it matter? Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It really doesn't matter. You know, some of them are going to have 87% for the top of zone two, some of them can have 90% for the top of zone two. Look, it doesn't matter. It's just the ballpark representation of what is happening metabolically so that we can make sure we're talking the same kind of language and eliciting the similar kind of stimulus to get the same kind of adaptation. So whether it's one or 2% different, it doesn't really matter. What we want to what we want to know is zone one, all right? So that's going to be, depends who you're looking at, less than 80%. Less than 80% of your threshold is going to be zone one and it's going to be exceptionally easy. It is going to be exceptionally easy. And then from 80% to 90%, somewhere around that range is going to be zone two. And that's going to be what we call a steady state effort. And depending on how well trained you are and how aerobically fit you are, you're going to be able to do that quite comfortably for an hour and as you get beyond an hour it's going to start to feel quite challenging and that's more due to muscular fatigue rather than metabolic fatigue then as we start to enter into zone three which would be kind of your 90 to 95 percent and that's going to be your around your marathon effort uh, so we're looking kind of three hours or more that effort is going to be it's that gray zone. You know, you know you're working hard, but it's definitely sustainable. And that's what we call tempo. And those tempo efforts are great bang for buck workouts, but you can't do them all the time because of the amount of muscular damage and also metabolic stress that's put on your system. If you do it all the time and you're training a lot, you'll just end up burn, burnt out. And you're not really training that fast and you're not really training that slow either. So, you know, it's that marathon pace. And then we enter into really, oh man, zone four changes for everyone. I like the, if we just say 96% to 105%, so right from 5% below 100%, so your threshold to 5% above, because it really depends on when you're working threshold on what efforts you're doing. If you're doing five minute efforts, you might be at, you know, a bit over 100%. If you're doing 10, 20 minute efforts, you might be a bit below. How tired are you? You know, what, what's the terrain like? Because it's going to lower your average and relative to your percent. Are you on a treadmill? You might be able to hold like a little bit higher. So that, that range, that zone four range is really just stimulating threshold. And we do these efforts when we're looking to increase your threshold and your ability to buffer that lactate and slow the rate at which you utilize all that carbohydrate that stored glycogen and the, the rate that that hydrogen ion burn, builds up. So, you know, limiting the rate at which you get that burning sensation in your legs. So if we can do that, then we can do that, those kind of efforts for longer. So that's where we're looking at 10K half marathon, you know, that Olympic distance triathlon to half Ironman, depending on, on how well trained you are. Then as we start to work above that, we're starting to get into those VO2 max efforts. So VO2 max meaning the maximal oxygen utilization. So although this, uh, I mean, VO2 max stuff is confusing. So we're talking about zone five. Joe Friel has zone five ABC. Other people have zone five, six, seven. Really doesn't matter. Like once we start to get above those zones, we're looking at, we're looking at VO2 max and maximal oxygen utilization. So we're stimulating the muscles to utilize as much oxygen as possible. And we're probably only maxed out at five minutes for intervals. Generally will be two to three minutes and 10 minutes in terms of an absolute max effort. So the maximal oxygen utilization peak time limit, it would be around 10 minutes. And so yes, there's an anaerobic component, but there also is so much muscle mass being used that you have maximized your aerobic capacity and on top of that you've complemented it with an anaerobic ATP production I mean this is this I'm doing this pretty quick this is pretty complex um, biochemistry and physiology but 
by doing those VO2 max efforts, we get a maximal stimulus of the aerobic uh, structures and enzymes within the muscle, and we can stimulate those to generate more mitochondria and then be able to produce more ATP, more aerobically, utilize more oxygen. But the recovery is long and the muscular damage is, is high. So we need to be careful with those VO2 max efforts. And that's really when we're looking at trying to run a lot faster and become a lot more efficient, but they are very demanding. And we do want a good separation in, in all of those efforts. So if you're zone two and zone five are only differentiated by you know, 20 seconds per K or you know, 30 watts, then that's not the point you want to be working on. We move on to zone five and then we have six and seven. Oh God. How they're going to be um, associated is, is going to really depend on what you read. But really, we're looking at neuromuscular and absolute speed. So we don't really care too much about the um, biochemical component. We're more looking at like a hormonal and neurological stimula stim stimulating change. So we're looking at range of motion, force production, rate of force production, and uh, placement of force production, all of these things, um, because you know, if you're doing hill sprints, you're not going to be running on your heels, you're going to be running on your toes, you're going to be generating a really large muscular force, uh, but it's going to be quite slow compared to doing downhill sprints. So that's those are just speed. Like you, you don't really necessarily need to care about those when you're looking at trying to build fitness. When we're looking at building fitness, we, we just have those five zones. And that's why some people just use the five zones. So you can differentiate easy, easy, steady, tempo, threshold, VO2 max. And it all is centered around that first threshold number. So zone four, now you're, once you're in zone four, you're in diminishing returns territory. And your time at zone four is going to be limited. And you want to work at that in those kind of 10 minute and if you're really well trained you might be able to do some 20 minute maybe even some 10k half an hour 40 minute efforts in zone four and that's going to allow you to really develop that threshold your ability to utilize all energy sources so that when you come to the race you're just going to be able to delay the inevitable slowdown by a little bit longer and hopefully generate a little bit more muscular force i mean we can get into training methodology principles and practices in another time but hopefully that is a good in-depth description of how threshold works and how it works in relation to the training zones and how you can utilize them all right so remember that this is available on a podcast format um, so audio spotify apple podcast wherever youtube and uh just follow me on you know, sign up to my i've got some webinars coming up um newsletter monthly newsletter Strava, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. I don't know. There's probably others. All right. All right. And Performance Advantage podcast. Check that out with I do with fellow sports scientist, Dr. Matt Miller. Till next time, guys. Catch you later. Have a good one. Happy training.